Welcome, thank you for coming along, a cold winter's night and all. So, throughout the month, you often look up at the sky and admire the moon. Well, I hope you do anyway. And, but often we just take it all for granted that it's there. But have you ever stopped to wonder, is there anything unique about our moon? Because you hear all these other planets have moons. What's special? Is our moon special or is it not? How was the moon formed? And is the moon important to us? How important is it? These are some of the questions. I know you ask these questions to yourself whenever you look up at the moon. I'm sure you do. So that's why tonight's talk is titled New Ideas on the Moon's Formation and Its Importance to Life on Earth. Where tonight we're going to talk about how indeed, how unique our moon is to us. How, how different it is to the moons of the other moons in the solar system. We're going to talk about five possible ways that the moon could have formed. With each one, we're going to put forward the argument for that possibility and the argument against it. And then there's the giant impact hypothesis, which is the fifth possibility we talk about. And that's been the most widely accepted cause for the, for the moon to have formed. But it's had its problems, and it hasn't been without debate. It's, it has had some issues and some tensions. But there's been an exciting new paper come out recently with some new supercomputer simulations that have put a lot of those concerns to rest. So I think that's quite exciting. So we're going to focus on that today. And then we'll talk about five good reasons why the moon is important to our very existence. Such that next time when you look up at the moon, you'll look at it in a different light. So I've split it into th these uh, three ones here, just some background introduction to the Earth and Moon system. Section two will be how the moon formed, and then we'll talk about the importance of the moon to life on Earth. Okay, so yeah, our moon is unique in the solar system, without a doubt. It's very large compared to its size of its host planet, which we'll, I'll show you, we're going to go over that. Then we'll talk about the composition of the moon, how, how do we know what the moon is made of and its structure, and then we'll talk about the findings of that, and that will all become relevant for the rest of the talk. So yeah, our moon is the largest, not absolutely the largest in the solar system, but relative to its host planet, absolutely by far. Diameter-wise, it's just over a quarter, almost a third of the diameter of the moon fits into the diameter of the Earth. The other thing, it's relatively close to us. The average distance in its elliptical orbit around the Earth is 385,000 kilometers. And the significance of that is that the gravitational forces between the Earth and the moon is quite significant. And you're probably aware of the, the gravitational force between two objects is related to the mass of one of them times the mass of the second object divided by the square of the distance between them. And the fact that you've got two you know, reasonably sized masses relatively close together, they ex ex exert quite a significant gravitational influence on each other. And that, that's very important to consider as well. Just let's have a look at how special our moon is. To the, so let's have a look at the other planets. First of all, Mercury and Venus, no moons. Mars just has two very small moons. They're sort of like they look like potatoes. They're just small little, probably captured asteroids or comets. Really, not much to mention at all. Jupiter has ninety-one small moons. Very similar concept to Mars's two small moons. Very relatively small, irregular-shaped objects with d completely different orbits, um, and most likely captured asteroids or type about objects or comets and so on that have gone into orbit around Jupiter. It has got four larger moons that are all nicely lined up, like here, with Io, Europa, um, Ganymede and Callisto. So that is relevant how these four big ones are lined up here. And they probably formed by, as Jupiter was forming, a, a disk formed around the planet Jupiter, and they probably formed from that there. It's going to be a little bit relevant later on to our, to our talk as well. But certainly, even those large, what they call Galilean moons, they're called Galat because Galileo 
first saw them when he put his telescope up there in 1610, but they're still relatively small to the size of Jupiter. Jupiter's massive. And then there's Saturn. It's got about 146 moons with a particular large one, Titan. Um, Uranus has got about 28 moons with five larger, relatively f f compared to those 28 larger ones. And Neptune's got 14 with one particularly larger than the other. But all these so-called larger moons are still very, very small compared with the size of their host planet. So really the big thing that sticks out here is the size of our moon compared to the host planet Earth is quite considerably large and relatively close. So how do they know about the internal structure of the moon and what it's made of? The bottom line is the Apollo moon landings. Six landings there in fairly um, diverse geological regions around the moon some up in the highlands, some down in the, the lowlands, on the Maria and so on. But the astronauts there, on each landing site, they left behind seismometers, so where they could measure the seismic activity inside the moon. And indeed, you do get moon quakes. Um, vibrations from asteroid impacts hit striking the moon, uh, tidal forces because the Earth has an influence on the moon, just like we get the water tides on the Earth, Moon gets some tides of the, and they've got six of these seismometers are, are scattered around the moon. And just like they do on Earth, that's how they work out the internal structure of Earth through seismology after earthquakes. They do the same principle here and they measure the vibrations at different sites and work out the internal structure of the moon. Another one, the Apollo astronauts between those six missions brought back 382 kilograms of moon rock that have been distributed all around the world. Some of them were even held back, knowing that with time, better technology would have better instruments, and they're still opening up packages of moon rock now to, to have a look at. But it certainly gave them a fair idea of the composition of the moon, the, the, the elementary composition, and also the uh, dating the rocks. So that's really how they've got a lot of information. The Apollo moon landings, in short, just invaluable, giving them information on the moon, and from there, working out how the moon possibly formed. So what did they find out from all of that? <clears throat> well, the moon has a relatively small iron core at its centre here, where the core of the moon is about 20% of its total diameter. So the diameter of the core is about 20% of the diameter of the moon, or about 1% by mass. Compare that with Earth. Earth's core, diameter-wise, is about 50%. The core is 50% of the diameter of the Earth and it makes up about 35% of the mass of the Earth. So quite a marked difference there, and that is very, very relevant. That, that's telling you something, which we'll come to. Okay, and as for its elements, um, the lunar crust is full of very light elements. There's a concept called chemical differentiation, and that's when you get something that's molten, like a, a planet that's, or any object that's molten, all the heavier elements and chemicals will sink to the, to the centre and the lighter ones will float to the top to form a crust and the middle ones tend to form the mantle and that's called chemical differentiation. And so they found evidence for this on the moon, how the very light elements like your calcium, silicon and oxygen etc had floated to the top and were part of the crust. Radiometric dating suggests the rocks on, from the crust were about 4.4 billion years old, and that sort of composition in the age matches the Earth's crust as well. Once again, that's telling you something. Um, the, and the maria, that's sort of the, the lava that had flowed and solidified, the basalt rocks that have come up from the mantle um, on the moon, once again, very, very similar composition and ageing to the Earth's mantle lava. I'm just going to introduce the idea of uh, <coughs> isotopes because oxygen isotope in particular. And just a quick bit of revision with an atom. Atoms in their nucleus have protons and, and neutrons, and they are surrounded by electrons. And it's the number of protons at the nucleus that determines what chemical element you have. In this case, we're looking at oxygen for a good reason. Oxygen has eight protons in it. But you can get, usually, you get eight neutrons match it as well, and it's called oxygen 16. But you can get a variation of the number of neutrons within the nucleus, and they're called isotopes. And in this example here, you've got eight protons, which tells you it's oxygen by definition, and you've got 10 neutrons, so it's called oxygen 18 isotope. So there's different isotopes of, of a lot of the elements, 
and oxygen, there's oxygen 16, 18, and there's also 17. And you can measure these and look at their ratios, and the ratio of oxygen 18 to 16, and the ratio of oxygen 17 to oxygen 18, sorry, 16 ratios, on the moons, the moon rocks are identical to that same ratio of the Earth's rocks and its crust. Once again, that's telling you something. What that tells you is this is when a star is forming, it develops this huge big circumstellar stellar disk of material gas and dust around it, also known as a protoplanetary disk, because it's this disk surrounding the star, or the protostar, that the planets will form. And each orbital region has a unique oxygen isotope ratio. So for example, all in this orbit here will all have that same oxygen isotope ratio, which will be different to out here, different to out here, and so on. So each planet, yet from the protoplanetary disk, has a, a signature set of isotope ratios for each element. And that tells you the orbital region in which something formed. So that indicates that the moon most likely formed in the same orbital region as the Earth. So all these things tell a story, all these little findings from the Apollo moon landings. So that's a little bit of background of the moon's composition and structure and the relevance, some of the relevance of that and how they find out. So let's have a look, how did the moon get there? How did we get this big, relatively big moon next to the Earth? So five different possibilities, which each one of them we're going to discuss now. So the first one is what we call the circumplanetary disk formation. And that's analogous to the circumstellar disk formation, whereby, and this, that's why I highlighted those Galilean moons in Jupiter, where you get a, a planet forming here and you get a nice big disk of material around the planet. And in this particular case, that you know, this, this hypothesis here is talking about Earth here, and there's some material that develops around it into a disk and that forms into the moon. Much pretty much analogous to those Galilean moons around Jupiter. So that's one possibility. And what goes for it? Yeah, it's seen elsewhere in the solar system. As I mentioned, Jupiter's Galilean moons, those four big moons. That would ex quite happily explain the matching isotope ratios, wouldn't it? Same orbital region, quite happily. But going against that, the moon, and, that, and if this was so, the moon should have the same proportion of elements. They shouldn't differ at all. In particular, remember that iron core. The, the Earth has got a relatively large iron core and the Moon's got a really relatively, you know, less, less than 1% of its mass, as opposed to 35% of the mass of the Earth is iron. So there's a difference there. So that just does not gel. The other thing is the Moon's orbital axis is tilted to the Earth's rotational axis. I'll show you. So here... The Earth's rotational axis, you're probably aware that the Earth's rot rotational axis is about 23 and a half degrees, so it doesn't spin like that. It's tilted 23 and a half degrees and it spins like that. So that's the Earth's rotational axis. And if you draw an orbital plane through the Earth here, the Moon is at a five degree inclination. Its orbit around the Earth is at a five degree tilt. And so there's a mismatch between the Earth's rotational axis and the orbital plane of the Moon. If it was this case here, you would expect these two to be matched up perfectly. That's what you would expect, but they don't. So that really goes uh, significantly against that idea. The next one is gravitational capture. So what's that all about? And that's about when the moon might have formed somewhere else in that protoplanetary disk, uh, and it's gone on a long sort of orbit, and its orbit happens to come close to Earth, and Earth gravitationally captures it and brings it in. And what goes for that, it's seen elsewhere in the solar system. Remember all those small moons, the Mars's two moons probably captured asteroids or, or comets perhaps. Remember Jupiter had 91 moons, four relatively big ones probably formed from that disk, but all its other ones were relatively small, probably captured Kuiper Belt objects and so on. And the rest of those big planets all with this little wee small irregular moons. So you see it elsewhere in the solar system. But going against it, those big planets further out in the solar system, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, 
What have they got in all in common to make to capture those small objects that go past? They are big planets with a lot of gravitational pull. They've got huge, big, thick atmospheres. Earth does not have that. Earth is not a biggie. It doesn't have a big, large, thick, wide atmosphere. And it's the atmosphere size and density is just too, it's just insufficient to be able to drag in something the size and the mass of the moon as it goes past. It just wouldn't happen. The other thing is that similarity with those oxygen isotope ratios that implied that the moon formed from the same orbital region around the sun as the Earth did. But according to this idea, it formed elsewhere. So once again, the similarity goes against that. So that really makes the gravitational capture possibility very, very unlikely. So how about fission? And the idea of fission is that when the Earth was young and molten, and it was wrapped, the Earth used to rotate a lot faster, many billions of years ago, and it was going fast enough whereby a piece, a chunk of molten rock split away and with centrifugal forces and formed the moon like that. And what goes for that idea is the density of the moon is similar to that of the Earth's crust, so that would fit with that picture quite nicely. But going against it is that the moon's orbital five degree axial tilt to the, ex to the ecliptic plane, and I'll show you about that. So here we go here. So here's the ecliptic plane. So the sun might be either here or there, but, but here's the ecliptic plane that the Earth goes around the sun in, and the moon's orbit is different by out by five degrees. So obviously, you know, if, if that was the case, you'd expect that moon to be in line with the ecliptic plane, but it's not. The other one, you might think, well, where, did, where would it have come from? And the only place they can really think of is the Pacific Oceanic Basin, this big area here, is the only area big enough on the Earth where that possibly could have come from. And the crust in that basin is less than 200 million years old. Clearly, it didn't come from there. So it just goes against it. Furthermore, even though that molto, molten proto-Earth rotation rate was much faster, it rotated about every four hours, so six times faster than it does now, that's still not sufficient to fling off a big blob of molten rock to form the moon, just insufficient. So that really makes that hypothesis or possibility very unlikely. So how about accretion? What's that all about? So accretion is the system whereby the Earth and the Moon formed together, but in almost like a binary system, as a double system within the, the disk, just like stars will, will sometimes form as a double system, that perhaps the Moon and the Earth formed as a double system at the same time, just together and hooked up gravitationally um, in, in the same region of the protoplanetary disk. What goes for that? The similar isotopic, those oxygen ratios, isotope ratios would go in favour with that. But going against it, once again, these different size iron cores. Remember, the, you'd expect the iron cores to be the same. And remember, in the, the, the Earth is about 50% of the diameter and about 35% of the mass, whereas with the Moon, it's only about 20% diameter and less than 1% of the mass. That just does not gel. That just does not add up. The other thing, it doesn't explain the, what they call the high angular momentum or spin off the Earth moon system. And that refers to it's a total of the, the rotational rate of the Earth, the rotational rate of the Moon, and the, the rate at which the Moon orbits the Earth. And combined, that all gives what they call a high angular momentum. And that really is the spin of the Earth and the spin of the Moon and the Moon's orbit. That's, there's a lot of angular momentum in there. And for this to happen with all their models, it, you just don't get those degrees of spins and orbital rates. So that it just does not explain the high angular momentum that, of the system that we see today. So that leaves us with the giant impact hypothesis. And this has been, um, for decades now, been the most widely accepted hypothesis, but it's not without its problems. But what it, does it involve? Let's have a look first what it involves, the conditions and the evidence for it. So the conditions were that Earth probably it was only about 100 million years old, so it was very molten, but it had gone through chemical differentiation with the heavy elements like the iron and the nickel, those heavy elements gone down to form the core, the lighter stuff like some of the silicon and the 
carbon and the oxygen floated to the top of the crust and you had your magnesium and manganese and so on in the middle for the dark, the dark mantle. So that had gone through chemical differentiation. It had, so it had a low amount of iron in its mantle because it had gone down to the, mainly gone down to the core. And it got struck by a body, another protoplanet, about the size of Mars, and I've just called it Thea, just to give it a name, fair enough. So Thea, a Mars-sized protoplanet that had formed in the same orbit in that protoplanetary disk, so the Earth might have been going over here and Thea over here, and they came together and they collided. The fact that, that, um, that this object was Thea was formed in the same orbit, that would explain the same oxygen isotope ratios on Earth, so it fills that quite nicely. And Thea struck the molten Earth, both were molten, both had gone through chemical differentiation, both objects, strikes it at an oblique angle and sets up a disk of debris that had formed around it. And over hundreds and thousands of years, all this debris slowly coalesced and formed into the moon. <clears throat> and that's been sort of most favoured out of all those there. So for it, collisions early in the solar system were very, very common. It was a pretty chaotic, violent place, the early days in the solar system. So collisions, yeah, absolutely. A glancing blow by Thea would have tilted Earth's axis, to that, given it that 23 and a half degree angle, quite happily. So it would explain that. It would explain a similar mix of elements and on the, between the Earth's crust and the, and the Moon's crust, and also the lack of volatiles in the Moon. If you had this huge, big, exp, you know, massive, violent impact, there would have been a lot of heat involved, and all your more volatile compounds and elements would have probably evaporated. So there's a lack of volatiles in the Moon, so it would explain that. It would also explain why you've got the small lunar iron core. 1% of the mass compared with 35 of the Earth. Why? Because remember, both were chemically <coughs> differentiated, the Thea smashed into the Earth. Earth's crust, which is very low in iron, got flung up. Thea, once again, it's, it's, it had a crust as well. That got flung up. And its iron, heavy, dense iron core would have gone into the Earth with the impact and sunk down to join the Earth's core. So it would explain why Earth's got a lovely, big, generous iron core and why the, Earth's, the Moon has a tiny, little, wee, runty little iron core. It explains that quite nicely too. So what goes against that, is, which is all done from previous computer models, according to these old computer models, the moon would have formed that debris disk and the moon would have formed and coalesced from there inside what they call the Earth's Roche limit. The Roche limit refers to an, a region, an area around a physical body, such in this case Earth, planet Earth, whereby it's got enough mass whereby its gravity within a certain region was too strong, where if something ventured close to it, with time it was, the tidal force would slowly pull it apart, think Saturn's rings, or the, it also implying that if you had all this debris, the tidal forces would not allow a moon to have formed in, in that region. So the, the previous computer models put that debris ring inside Earth's Roche limit, and that's been a problem. The other one is it still does not explain the Earth-Moon system's current high angular momentum. It doesn't explain the, the, the combination of the you know, reasonably rapid Earth spin, the, the, the Moon spin, the Moon's orbit rate around Earth. That's a quite a, a considerable amount of angular momentum and it just does not explain that. The computer models do not account for that, cannot explain it. Another thing is why just one Moon? You know, if that had it happened, you, you know, you could have got, like, like with, um, with, with Jupiter, had four Galilean moons. You could have had two, three, four. Just, it's just a question to throw in there. Why just one moon? So that's been some of the problems. So along comes the new generation of supercomputers that they've now got, and they're able to do computer simulations of much, much higher resolutions, where they can be up to a 1,000 times more detailed um, most of them up till now have had 100,000 up to a million particles as their si simulation. Is this new one that they've done from a paper that was released and um, published in 2022 had 100 million particles, and they said it's 1,000 times more detailed than your standard simulations. So they ran about 400 simulations for this, 
And I've put in here, if you want to take a photo of that, if you're interested in looking at the paper, or if you email, if, you want, if you're interested in an actual copy of the paper, I can send you a PDF of it. Um, I've got my email address at the end, membership at astronomy.org.nz, and I'll send you a PDF of the paper. But that, that's the uh, reference for it there. So they did about 400 simulations under various conditions. And essentially, they proved that it's perfectly feasible. All those problems, they offered solutions to all those problems with the giant impact hypothesis, suggesting, yes, it's perfectly feasible. And the other four are just out of the question. So instead of hundreds of thousands of years, they put all this happened in about 48 hours, this whole business. So it, the Earth was struck by Thea at an oblique angle that did tip it over. Both were molten. Both had gone through chemical differentiation. But it, with the simulation and better sort of dynamics and understanding of it, they got a much better understanding. So debris was flung into a, to a plume forming two moons or satellites over about 24 to 48 hours. You can see there's one big blob forming here, and I'm going to show you a computer graphic shortly, a little video illustrating this. But two satellites formed, which eventually was left over with one moon, and it results you know, with a satellite with the moon's mass and the moon's iron content outside of Earth's Roche limit, all formed in 24 to 48 hours, is with, and with the result explains all these and gets rid of all the previous problems. Just going through a little bit more detail. They can concluded with their simulation that almost all of the debris, remember the last one said that a good chunk of that debris came from Thea and a good chunk of that came from the Earth's crust and Thea's crust. Their simulation showed if you get that right angle and that right impact, that you can get it where almost all of the debris to create the moon comes from Earth's crust, not Thea's. And what that does, I didn't mention early on, but also there's a titanium isotope ratio, a 50 to 47, titanium 50 to titanium 47 isotope ratio, and it's really uncanny. The lunar titanium isotope ratio is identical exactly as Earth's. That really, really is uncanny. This explains it beautifully because it came from Earth's crust. There's no mixture with some other thing going on, with some other object. Objects very often just tend to have slightly, even where and when they formed, they have different titanium isotopes. But the Earth's crust and the lunar crust is identical. You can't ignore that. That's been a big problem. The other thing that this, what this does, is that the debris all comes from from the Earth's crust and not there, it removes that constraint. We know up till now that oxygen ratios, the isotope ratios were identical, suggesting that there came from the same orbital region as the Earth. Suddenly that constraint has been removed. Just opens things up a little bit for more combinations. And with more detailed your dynamics of the collision and the aftermath and so on, um, yes, it does, the, which you'll see on a, in the video shortly, they're able to explain the, the solution all matches perfectly well with Earth, the Earth Moon's current angular momentum and also the Moon's axial tilt. The fact that the Moon's orbit around is slightly tilted as well, it fits that beautifully. And here it is here. I've got a little, I think we've got the sound sussed out on here. It's crazy electronic music, so if it doesn't work, it doesn't bother me too. It's that, oh, probably you, after it, you probably wish. You'll probably wish, wish it wasn't working. But anyway, so let's have a look. This is just under two minutes. Here we go. See what I mean? I'll play this over twice. Here's the two satellites. Big one's going back into the Earth, which sets up a spin as well, to, and pushes this one outside of the Roche limit and gives it angular momentum. Here we are, we're repeating it. You can just see the angular momentum it's giving the whole system.
So there you go. Yeah, so that new supercomputer simulation, much more higher resolution and more advanced, going through different scenarios, shows, yeah, it's perfectly feasible. The giant impact hypothesis does not have to have any problems. And the other four are just totally riddled with major problems. So that sort of really puts a lot of uh, strong evidence in favour of that's how the moon formed. So that's how the moon formed. Let's talk about now, move on a little bit. Is the moon important to us? Would we be managed without the moon? Let's, let's have a look. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> yeah. Here's five good reasons why the moon is important to us being here, to allow complex life to evolve and thrive on Earth. And we'll talk about all five of them now. So first of all, we've got four moderate seasons. And seasons are good and that it allows relatively mild temperature without dramatic changes, but you know, you're just quietly moving through different temperature and, and environmental changes throughout the year. Life thrives on little changes. It doesn't like big changes and it doesn't like no change. Because if you don't have change, you don't get evolution. That's the whole thing of evolution is based on change. So seasons allow complex life to change and evolve, but on the proviso that they're reasonably mild, and that's what it does. So mild temperature changes and climate cycles. So the next question is you might say, then why do we have four moderate seasons? The answer to that, of course, is because of the axial tilt of the Earth, that 23.5 degree tilt. That's what gives us our seasons. And then you might say, well, what causes the tilt? Remember, that collision when Thea hit the, came in an oblique angle, and the impact, and it tilted the Earth over to an oblique angle. It's called obliquity. If you see that word obliquity, it just means axial tilt, because you see that crop up from time. I remember the first time I saw that word. What's that all about? It just means axial tilt. And it's that collision with Thea that put the earth on its axial tilt that gives us these nice four relatively mild seasonal changes. We've also, Earth's got a lovely big strong called globe, global magnetosphere, which means it's got these big magnetic field lines wrapping around the earth Nice, nice big field lines there. And the importance of them is they protect us against harmful radiation. The sun's radiation is sending charged particles to us. There's charged particles coming from, from out, out into the galaxy, They're coming towards us all the time as a constant flux and so on. And they would cause harm to our DNA, to young life getting started or damaged DNA. Life would really struggle. Life would die off very readily if these strong radiation, not to mention ultraviolet light and so on, that would, does damage as well from the sun. And so our strong magnetosphere protects us against powerful radiation that would do damage to, to our DNA. So why do we have a protective global magnetosphere, you might ask? And it all comes down to this big iron, this big molten iron core in the centre of the earth. And remember, it's quite large, it's 50% of the diameter of the Earth's diameter. It, by mass, it's 35% uh, uh, of the Earth's mass is tied up in this core. So we've got a relatively large iron core, and it's that iron core, it's a complex between the slushing around, rotating of the Earth, and with the heat coming out, causing convection and so on, to get a dynamo effect, and you get these big magnetic field lines wrapping around, protecting us from harmful radiation to our DNA, complex life's DNA. Next thing is, so how did the Earth get so much iron? <clears throat> Thea colliding with the Earth, of course. Remember, both were molten, both had undergone chemical differentiation, so both had molten iron cores with the impact, and most of Thea's material just went straight into the Earth, and the iron of core from Thea would have sunken in and, and, and added to the iron core already at the Earth. And as the new models suggest, essentially all of Thea was absorbed into the Earth. So that's how we got our big iron core, which gives us a magnetosphere, which protects complex life's DNA. <clears throat> Plate tectonics, you're probably all familiar with that. It's whereby Earth has, its crust has got some thin plates and they're able to, to come together or pull apart in particular, they're able to subduct, dive underneath one another, heat up and create volcanic activity and so on. So that is very, very important to life. Why? It's all to do with the carbon cycle. 
Carbon is very vital for life on Earth, and carbon is sort of is, is gets stored in the atmosphere as a reservoir, in the oceans as a reservoir, and in the rocks. And it goes be between them. In particular, it will go into from the atmosphere into the water, then into the rocks. And you don't want it staying there. You want it to keep it going out. And the, the carbon indeed does get cycled because of that subduction. We're going back here, <clears throat> you get the carbon in here, like as in carbonate rocks, goes down here, gets melted, comes back out here and gets spewed out the CO2 into the atmosphere. And so that's called the carbon cycle. And why have we got a carbon cycle? Because of our tectonic plates. And carbon you know, is stored, so it's really important to recycle. It's the chemical backbone of life and also our food source as well, full of carbon. So you can't have that just locked up in the rocks, but because it's got a thin crust, tectonic plates creates, spews it out and puts the carbon back into the atmosphere. And also it helps to regulate Earth's temperature as well. So the carbon cycle is very, very vital. So what factor led to the tectonic plates? <clears throat> yep, Earth's very, very thin crust. Earth has a very, very thin crust. It's about 1% of the, the, the mass of the Earth. So why is our crust so thin? The collision was there. Remember, it, sp it struck in there and threw up a huge big pile of Earth's crust to form the moon. So the moon's crust was, was immediately minimized, reduced. So, um, because the, the, the eject from the Earth was predominantly from its crust formed the Moon. So it gave us a thin crust, which gave us tectonic plates, which allows the carbon cycle to occur, which is important for life as well. The other the fourth factor in here is ocean tides. You're familiar with these. And Earth does experience significant ocean tides. The Earth, billions of years ago, the moon was a lot closer to the Earth and the Earth was rotating faster. The moon's receding away from the Earth, I think it's about 3.8 centimetres away from the Earth every year. And in conservation of angular momentum, is the Earth is very, very subtly slowing down. So early on, the Earth was rotating a bit quicker. I think we worked out it was about um, six times as fast, wasn't it, every four hours. But also the ocean tides with that moon so much closer, the tides were huge. And that whole business of a rapidly rotating Earth with at a high angular momentum because of the collision, the formation of the moon, plus the moon really close with big tides, it was like an agit like a washing machine agitator. Those oceans were getting swished around. Great stuff for stirring up all the chemicals for life in there. They weren't just lying idle or sitting on the bottom of the ocean. No, they were getting stirred up like crazy. Great for chemical reactions. So those high tides in the early years, great for mixing up and helping life get underway. The tides in those days probably went up to about two kilometres inland which would have been great for, for fish getting trapped in, in rock pools or just getting pushed up onto land and slowly over many thousands and millions of years, you know, the, so the, the sea fish would have thought, you know, some little legs develop. Well, we're stuck on land. Let's get some legs going here. And uh, so that also would have been ideal for evolution for land-based animals, just those huge big two-kilometre tides and land tides. So how did we get such favourable tides for developing life and evolving life? The moon! It's the moon that causes tides on either side there. And uh, once again, it's our moon. It's come to the rescue, giving us these big tides. Mix those chemicals up, push fish and, and sea creatures onto the land. The other one is moderate and stable climates. Yes, yeah, so life prefers, as we mentioned, prefers likes changes to help it evolve, but moderate one. But it also prefers climates having low rates of what are called centennial change. And we all know we go through climate changes and life is pretty resilient. It gets over that. I think we've had about a couple snowball Earths, but it doesn't like them done too quickly. So they tend to call it centennial change, a change over every sort of packets of 100 years. And Earth does not experience rapid climate changes over, say, packets of 100 years. Though I think humans are doing our best to prove that wrong right now, aren't we? Um, but that's another, that's another story, we won't go there. Um, but you get my point that we don't have, you know, left 
Let's take humans out of the equation. Nature, yeah, does, you know, Earth's been pretty, you know, has low rates of centennial climate change over the, uh, over the millions of years. So how did we get a relatively stable climate sort of changes on Earth? And it all comes down to Earth's axial tilt. Remember, it's at 23 and a half. And that doesn't change. It only changes by about one degree either side. So the Earth's axial tilt or obliquity, we're about 23 and a half now. And it alters between about 22 and a half and then up to about 24 and a half. And it only changes about one degree every 10,000 years. So there's a 40,000 year cycle there of axial tilt or obliquity changes. And so that gives us our relative, it holds that nice and stable because if the Earth was swinging this way and that way, you'd get some huge climate changes. Whereby Mars, remember Mars only has those two little potatoes, probably captured asteroids around it, which are next to nothing. Mars axial tilt or obliquity, historically the evidence is it's, it's swung from anything about 10 degrees to 60 degrees. It some, had some huge swings with some massive climate changes going on, evident in the history of Mars. We just don't have get that on Earth, which is good for complex life. So why is this so? Why is Earth's axial tilt so stable? Our moon, you guessed it, absolutely. Our moon, it's so large next to us, it sits there and it just gives the Earth's axial tilt some stability and does, it stops it from wobbling all over the place such as that you see with Mars. So, <clears throat> that's just wrapping up here. The moon is very large relative to Earth. It's host planet, which makes it very unique in the solar system. The moon likely formed from the giant impact with Thea. There's strong evidence for that. New high resolution models compounds that strong evidence and also uh, provides solutions to the previous problems and tensions from the previous uh, models uh, around the giant impact hypothesis. And the moon's formation and its existence is important, if not essential, to life on Earth, to its development and its evolution and us. I hope you've enjoyed new ideas on the moon's formation, its importance and relevance to life. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> I, put the, I put my email address there.